recording. I, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Freddie Revia today. He's been a long time uh, supporter and participant with GAPS, and I'm sure many of you have heard him speak before. So we're really excited to have him back. This is definitely an area of expertise for him. Um, he's our go-to person in Greenville when we talk about DBS. Uh, so Dr. Revia, thanks for being with us today, and I will turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Lauren. It's a real pleasure for me to be here talking to the group. I always enjoy these conferences. And of course, this is a new environment, the virtual environment for all of us. But uh, when it works, it works. So I appreciate you doing this and everybody connecting this way. If, if any of the audio is interrupted or the slides that I'm showing, please let me know. And um, there will be time for questions at the end as well. I think, Lauren, we, you said we have uh, one hour. Is that correct, total? Correct. We're here from okay, one to two. OK, perfect, perfect. And these, these are called the coffee talks, right? This is called the coffee talk. So yeah, here's my, so here's my coffee. Morning, you can, that's right. You can still drink coffee at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So okay. drink your coffee. OK, well, everybody should have their coffee with them, I hope. <laughs> All right. So the, the topic that uh, we're going to discuss today is deep brain stimulation. And this is a surgical procedure. And let me tell you how I got to speak to you about this. I um, did my neurology residency and fellowship in movement disorders in St. Louis, Missouri at Washington University more than 20 years ago. And at the time when I was training there, this is really more than in the mid nineties, my mentor came to me and my other, you know, fellows and students that we were studying neurology at the time. And we discussed these papers from a French doctor from Grenoble, France, in the Alps, in the French Alps. And my mentor told me, There's, this is impossible. There's no way this data is correct. So we reviewed the publications and the papers. And so it was about this new procedure that came out in France called deep brain stimulation. And um, it turned out to be very true, actually, the data. And I had the opportunity during my training as a fellow in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Grenoble, France, and I attended one of the surgeries with the original surgeon, Dr. Benabit, in, in France, in a beautiful region of the French Alps, actually. Grenoble is considered like the Silicon Valley of France because all the technology development occurs there. And I got to see firsthand how the procedure was done. And then this was applied at Washington University in St. Louis as well in the mid to late 90s. And we learned to do the procedure there. It is done by a team approach. So there's a neurosurgeon and there's a neurologist usually involved. So in my case, I'm the neurologist involved in the procedure. We do it here in Green Mill as well with, with our neurosurgeon, Dr. Phil Hodge. And um, even our nurse practitioners who are connected to the talk right now and listening, uh, take care of our patients and do the programming of the stimulators. So that's kind of the background for how I got into this field in training in Parkinson's movement disorders, and then learning about how to participate during the surgeries, doing the neurology part that the, of this fascinating, amazing procedure that was started in France more than 20 years ago. So um, my first slide here is to show you, and what I don't know is if you can see my pointer moving around the picture. Can you see my pointer or not? Let's see if Yeah, Lauren we can. can't. Yeah, we can't see it moving. You you can. We cannot. Okay. Okay. So that's okay. So I'm just going to talk over the slide and point uh, you to what you need to see. So there's a picture here of a person. And, and you see on the left side of the picture, there is a um, stimulator, which is basically a wire or, or an electrode. Believe it or not, that goes deep inside the brain and electricity is applied to that wire, which runs under the skin behind the ear, connected to a pulse generator. So for those of you in the audience who are engineers, this is basic electricity. You see, this is an electrode and in the bottom of the slide, you can see the picture of the electrode with four contacts labeled zero, one, two, and three. And 
The bullet points on the slide read stimulation lead implanted in the VIM, which is just the part of the brain that is the target for the stimulator in the case of tremor patients. Number two, uh, there's a pulse generator that is implanted here under the clavicle in the body by the neurosurgeon. And number three, there's of course a lead extension or a wire or a connection that connects the two pieces, okay? So in the next slide, I have an example of a patient uh, who has a neurological disease called essential tremor. So this is not Parkinson's disease, just, just to illustrate to you the power of this therapy and as a proof of principle, what we are able to do by placing an electrode with electricity inside the brain. This patient had severe tremor on the left side with the stimulator off. And you can see the patient shaking as we turned off the stimulators. And on the right side of the slide, there is a video of the same patient with the stimulators on. And so you can see the dramatic difference between the two slides here. These are just separated by a few seconds. It's an instantaneous effect in these patients with essential tremor where you can turn the stimulator on or off and reduce the amount of tremor because you are interrupting an abnormal circuit in the brain that is generating the tremor. So I hope, I hope everything that I said makes sense as um, to show how the tremor can be stopped in a patient with this condition. Now, for uh, my nurse practitioners who are in the talk as well and medical assistants on these pictures, you can see as well uh, to the side of the patient, there is the old programmer machine that we used to use at the time. When this therapy came out, this is a big kind of a suitcase that we carried around and that's how we use the, the technology to program the stimulator. So switching now to Parkinson's disease, in the next slide, it says Parkinson's disease case number one that I always like to show when I teach about this topic. This is a case of a 54 year old man with Parkinson's for 13 years, so more than 10 years, with severe dyskinesias, which means the involuntary movements that occur as the disease progresses and uh, after taking the medication, with severe motor fluctuations, meaning ups and downs, severe off-period dystonia, meaning involuntary contraction of the muscles when the medication wears off, and you will see in one of the videos that I have, severe freezing of gait and the whole body really freezing with the Parkinson's symptoms, frequent dose failures, and a high levodopa requirement, meaning this patient had to take a, a lot of cinemet or carbidopa levodopa to, to be able to function and talk and walk, and of course, severe disability. Now, this is not everybody, so I want to make sure that what we call Parkinson's disease in modern science and neurology is really a group of diseases that we have not been able to identify separately. So this may explain why when you go to a support group or when you meet other people with Parkinson's disease, everybody looks somewhat different compared to the others. So it's hard to make a comparison. I want to make that clear. In less than 5% of cases with Parkinson's, there may be a genetic component involved. In 95%, there's not. But again, I don't want everybody to feel that everybody with Parkinson's has the symptoms that I'm going to show, but this is just one example of that. And this patient was kind enough to share these home videos with me to use in my conferences. So on the left side of the screen, I'm going to play the video now. And you can see the patient is in the off levodopa state, meaning that the cinemet has wore off. The patient is awake, completely immobile in bed because he simply could not get up and walk and has all the muscle contraction, including the curling of the toes and the hand and the elbow um, that is typical of the off period dystonia, okay? So this is a patient with a severe off state when the medication wears off. This particular patient had to take the medication every one hour and 15 minutes because that's the duration of the effect of the medication. Now, when he was on, you can see that he regained the ability to move, but he developed these involuntary movements that we call dyskinesia. So these are the classic movements that Michael J. Fox has when he shows on TV, for example. 
But the point of this video is to show the dramatic difference between the left side of the medication and the right side on the medication, okay? Now, somebody who is like this, fluctuating up and down so much during the day, could be a good candidate for the deep brain stimulation surgery. So the next slide shows the same patient after having the surgery on the left side with the stimulator off and on the right side with the stimulator off. And this is without any medication involved. So you would imagine that the patient with the medication off would be extremely uh, severely affected by the Parkinson's symptoms. So on the, on the stimulation off side on the left, he's trying to move the hand like I'm doing and having some tremor in the leg. And with the stimulator on, there's an, a better improved ability to move the hand, open and close the hand and the tremor went away. In similar fashion, when we tested rapid alternating movements, which we're asking the patient to do this on his lap, it almost looked like the image has frozen there because the patient is not able to move the hand. But on the right side with the stimulator on, you can see that the movements take place. Arising from the chair on the left side with the stimulator off, the patient is trying to get up of the chair and has a hard time. And on the right side with the stimulation on, the patient was able to get up of the chair relatively quickly. So again, as a proof of principle, the point is that with the stimulation, we are pretty much seeing a beneficial effect, almost similar to what the medication was providing, right? And here in this slide, the stimulators on allow the patient to walk even without medication. And the patient's balance improved to the point that, that the balance test that, that we, what you saw there is the nurse applying a pool called the, the balance test or the pool test to see if the patient has to be helped or not. And then on the bottom of the slide, it says the stimulation on on levodopa. And so after the stimulators are on, we gave the patient the usual dose of medication or a lower dose actually. And then you, you can see in the video that the patient is walking much better and even smiling for the camera and much happier. So you can see that the combination of medication, which is a wonderful medication for Parkinson's, the levodopa called Cinemet and the stimulation together provided the best benefit for this patient. So I hope that illustrates the point of the power of this therapy in combination with the medication usually. I have a second example that I'm going to show Parkinson's disease case number two of a 55 year old woman with Parkinson's disease similar for 13 years in her case with severe dyskinesias, the involuntary movements, with severe motor fluctuations, with off-period freezing episodes, which are shown in the videos here. So the main characteristic of this patient is that when the medication wore off, she had difficulty walking and had what we call freezing of gait. Frequent falls as a consequence and severe disability from these symptoms. And on the left side, the patient is shown without levodopa, and she's trying to traverse the hallway in her home and she's getting stuck there. The legs are, are moving like this. She has to hold on to the wall. This is called freezing of gait. Again, not everybody has this. The medication usually helps with this symptom. And on the right side, you can see that the patient, after taking the levodopa or cinema, is cruising through the hallway without problem. And again, showing off a little bit for the camera. The husband is uh, videotaping here, but she's showing how. And I don't think you can hear the the audio from the video, but she's saying, I feel normal, I feel relaxed, as opposed to the left side where the levodopa is not really working because, because it's wore off, okay? Again, <clears throat> this slide is showing the difference between being medication on the right and off medication on the left. And for somebody who has these dramatic motor fluctuations, we always think of deep brain stimulation surgery. So this patient had the deep brain stimulation surgery and the patient is shown on the left with the stimulators off without medication, with some freezing on the turns, as you can see there, and with the stimulator on on the right. And this is without medication at all in both uh, segments. You can see on the right, she's really walking much better and going through the hallway in the clinic much faster. 
Whereas on the left side, the patient is falling backwards when we do the pull test and has the freezing of gait. So that illustrates another feature of the disease that can be improved with uh, deep brain stimulation. <clears throat> One important comment is that uh, the deep brain stimulation does not always help with the freezing of gait, but sometimes it does. So the rule of thumb is that whenever we see a, a symptom that improves with the levodopa, then the D DBS or deep brain stimulation may help as well. So next I'm going to show you a graph of how I think of Parkinson's disease and the progression over time. When we see a patient with early Parkinson's disease in the first one, two, three, four, five years of symptoms and diagnosis, we call it early Parkinson's disease, and we see no fluctuations whatsoever. So in this graph, you can see that red line, which means that um, on the left side of the graph, we put the patient on medication for the per first time in their lives and the patient became on, meaning the symptoms improved quite dramatically, almost to the point that when the patient is on, the patient themselves come to us and say, I don't think I have Parkinson's. And the doctors call me sometimes from the hospital, if the patient is in the hospital or from the primary care physician office, and, and they ask me if I'm sure that we see Parkinson's symptoms. But the truth is, the medication helps so much in the beginning that the patient uh, becomes almost completely normal. And we say the patient is on and there's no fluctuations. As you can see, there is a red line on the top on the on side. What happens when Parkinson's disease uh, progresses and there's more advanced symptoms, and we call that late Parkinson's disease, fluctuations develop. So instead of the patient being on all the time on the top of the graph, the person may take the medication and you can see there's a first peak and then the medication wears off. And with the second dose, it peaks again and so on and so forth. So in this case that I'm showing, you can see six peaks here, which means the patient is taking six doses of Cinemet, for example, or sometimes another medication. And not only are there these peaks and valleys, but also those yellow, um, stars there uh, symbolize the dyskinesia. So the patient may develop dyskinesia or involuntary movements. And that can happen at the peak of the dose. Now, as you have seen on the example that I showed earlier, my patient with the severe dyskinesia before the surgery, the patient wanted to be in the on state with the dyskinesia uh, on the top, because on the bottom of the graph, when the medication wears off in the off state, it was very difficult to move or perform any activities of daily living, as, as you can imagine. So what is the role of deep brain stimulation? And STN means subthalamic nucleus for the target that we use. But what is the role of deep brain stimulation? As you can see in this graph, I put a new line, a green line that is on the top of, of the whole graph. So this line allows the patient to be closer to the on state and, and not dropping into the severe off state. As you can imagine on the examples that I showed earlier of those two patients, the patients were able to be closer to the on state without dropping into those severe states like being in bed, unable to move or having the severe freezing of gait. And of course, this is much uh, a much better situation compared to going up and down with each dose of medication, as you can imagine for the patient. Typically, the dyskinesias go away. And so as you so I just uh, remove the, the yellow stars from the graph. The dyskinesias tend to go away because usually patients who have this procedure are able to reduce the medication by 50% on average and the dyskinesias tend to decrease or go away. And this is the new graph. So I'm going to put back the one with, before the surgery here with the dyskinesias there. And after the surgery, patients report to us that they are now in this new pattern with less of periods and more um, sustained on periods. So I hope this graph illustrates the main point of the talk, which is not everybody has the same symptoms of Parkinson's. Not everybody with Parkinson's have the same response to the medication and the surgery. Not everybody with Parkinson's has these severe ups and downs, but for those patients who have the severe ups and downs, the surgery may help the best as I showed in this graph. Now, in neurology, we, used a lot, we use a lot of um, research studies to show the effects of these 
treatments, but just to focus on the fact that in this graph on the left, you can see the big change be between the white bar, which is the degree of Parkinson's symptoms, to the first uh, black bar. So there's a significant improvement with the medication on the left side of the slide. And on the right side, when you see the white bar compared to the black bar, they're much closer. And that is off a non-medication, but with the presence of the stimulator. So the stimulator does help quite significantly the patient. This is some of our own data that I put for completeness. And in this, this is another important way to think of this. So the clinical effects of bilateral subthalamic nucleus stimulation, and, and just to focus on the two charts that I'm showing on the slide. On the left side, you see this um, uh, white piece or slice of the pie on the bottom, which represents the off periods, the, the color white. And on the right side, the pie chart on the right, uh, six months after deep brain stimulation surgery, shows that that slice of being in the off time is much smaller, actually. So that's another way to think of how DBS helps. It decreases the amount of off time significantly. And on the left, on the left graph, you can see the gray part of the chart is on time without this kinesia, meaning this is the really good time for the patient where they can do their activities of daily living. And when you compare it to six months after the surgery on the right side, you can clearly see a larger area on the gray color representing a much uh, larger um, uh, amount of the on time without this kinesia. And in black is the on, on time with this kinesia, which is also reduced by the surgery. And then to summarize all these graphs, I'm showing you here the ideal outcome of a patient who goes through this surgery. On the left side, you can see the patient before having the surgery going up and down. And we say that this person is a great candidate for the surgery because they have these ups and downs, but when they are on the up, on the on, the person has great benefit from the medication. And after subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation surgery, look at the graph on the right, the patient is still having some on and off, but it's closer to the on state. And so we talk about, if you read the bullet points, there's new on periods that are similar before the surgery. There are off periods that may improve and become much shorter. There are longer on periods without dyskinesias. And the threshold for dyskinesias is much higher after the surgery. So we don't see the dyskinesias as much as we did before the surgery. And as a consequence, the dopaminergic therapy or the cinemet, Livodopa, et cetera, can be reduced. Now, let me make a brief comment about the targeting or what parts of the brain we target and how we do that. So there are different methods to find the exact part of the brain where the stimulator needs to go to. There's conventional methods that mentioned on the, on the first bullet point. There is visual targeting on MRI. So every patient who, who is a candidate for this procedure will get an MRI and Dr. Hodgson, a neurosurgeon, myself and others will uh, look at the anatomical um, organization of the different parts of the brain on the MRI. There are computerized methods as well and something called neurophysiologic mapping with microelectrodes. And for that fourth bullet point is the part that usually the neurologist like myself does in the operating room. And I have an example of how that looks in the operating room as well. So <clears throat> this is just to show a picture of the MRI of a patient superimposed. We have an anatomical detail <clears throat> of that part of the brain. And again, is, this is just to illustrate the complexity of the inner makings of the brain. And um, I'm not going to, to take uh, a test of neuroanatomy after the conference, uh, unless I guess my nurse practitioners will probably have to take the test, but there is one part very deep in the brain called STN, called the subthalamic nucleus. And it, um, unfortunately I cannot use my pointer to show you, but it's in the middle of the slide and it's very small. So imagine a structure a little larger than a peanut and actually, Believe it or not, I have a couple of peanuts here to show you because I love peanuts. So here's a peanut, I'm holding it in my hand right now, right there. The, the subthalamic nucleus is just a little larger than, than this peanut. So it is difficult to target unless you use very precise technology 
which again, this technology was developed in France in the late 80s and the early 90s and mid 90s, and it came to the US in the mid to late 90s here. And so we do the MRI and we look at the different parts of the brain. Uh, there's different methodologies to target this by the neurosurgeons. So these are just some of the instruments that uh, some neurosurgeons use here uh, in Greenville. We use a different set of instruments that I, I will show in a minute without a frame actually. But this is what we see in the computer. So uh, here on this graph on the top of the slide on the left, you can see, and for those of you who like music or who are engineers or technology savvy, these are no other than um, brain waves. And on the top, middle and bottom, you can clearly see the difference between the brain waves. On the top, you see these large spikes in between some silence. On the middle, which corresponds to a part of the brain called zone inserted, you see much more of a silenced area. And on the bottom, you see a lot of activity, increased activity. The cells are really active and firing and making a lot of noise and having a lot of activity. And so each one of the parts of the brain that are shown on the little graph on the right side of the slide has a name and has a, a specific pattern of sound and brain wave that we can see in the computer. So this is almost like um, when fishermen go into the sea and they use sonar to fish and they can identify what's underneath the surface of the water. This is a system of navigation through the brain with a microelectrode. It, it really is like a long needle. And then the microelectrode has an antenna on the tip that is picking up all this activity from the cells. And we can pretty much navigate through these different parts of the brain and be able to tell where we are in this navigation process. And when we find the right part of the brain, which is uh, the subthalamic nucleus, as an example, on the bottom of the graph, then this micro, this, I'm sorry, this is the actual electrode, is dropped in place. Each, um, each one of these metal uh, contacts, which you see four of them, typically measures one and a half millimeters. So the, the dimensions are, of course, small, as you can see, the magnitude of this. This is an electrode that looks like a very thin wire. And this is what the neurosurgeon ends up implanting in there. And here I have a nice picture taken by uh, a research assistant, Enrique Urrea Mendoza, who's depicted on the right. That's a nice picture of Dr. Hodge, our neurosurgeon uh, on the left side in the operating room here in the Greenville Memorial Hospital performing the operation. So it is a relatively big surgery. It's very straightforward. At this point during the surgery, the patient that you see in the picture is wide awake and talking to us. And this is just to show the, the equipment or the machine that we use. It's just a regular laptop with some specialized software made by different companies. And we connect this to the instruments on the head of the patient and we can pick up the signals from the brain. So it's really fascinating when you look at the technology that allows us to do that. These are some other pictures of the um, laptop screen and how the different parts of the brain look when we do the recording in the operating room. And then the question is, after we do the surgery, how can we tell if the electrodes were placed in the right uh, part of the brain? Well, there are many ways. The, the best way is when you come back to the clinic to see us and typically Yuzi and Osike, one of our nurse practitioners, will help us do the programming. She's really the expert here. And then if we are able to turn the stimulators on and get significant benefit, that to me is enough proof that we put the electrodes in the right spot, okay? Because we're getting benefit. But for research papers and um, to confirm, we can always look at imaging studies. And this is just an example of a post-operative CAT scan on the left and a pre-operative MRI on the right. And we have a specialized software that allows us to superimpose the images. And so we can see the electrodes um, uh, exactly where they are in terms of the anatomy of the patient. And, and these are some just images to show you the type of software that is used to plan the surgery and to be able to navigate through the right places in the brain. And in the end, um, this is what matters the most. As you can see in this cartoon depiction, um, the, the, what I showed you on the MRI and the atlas of the brain um, that we showed earlier, this is a cartoon showing the structure called STN that I said is a little bigger than a peanut. It's a subthalamic nucleus. 
And the different circles of different colors in this slide show what could happen if we put the electrode in the wrong place. So for example, if we put the electrode in the yellow spot there, the patient may have sensory symptoms and numbness and tingling, et cetera, which are not desirable or desired. If the electro goes in that orange spot, there can be diplopia, which means the eyes can cross and have double vision, other problems with your eye movements. Uh, if we place the electro too deep where, where that uh, blue, light blue circle is, there can be some changes in mood and even depression and things like that. If, you, if we place it too uh, far out to the side on that pink circle, there can be muscle contractions and, and dystonia and dysarthria, which means difficulty speaking. And finally, on the green circle, you can see it says reduction of rigidity, tremor, akinesia, bradykinesia, which is what we want to see. So that's the desired effect. And it also says induction of dyskinesia, which means when we put the electrode in that spot, we can create more dyskinesias, which is desirable as well, because that allows us to decrease the medication and find that delicate balance between the high peaks and the low valleys. So this is just to illustrate the point that the navigation system is important to find the right spot. And if we don't find the right spot, then we're not going to get the desired effect. Uh, now on the on the positive side, any of these effects that you that you see written here, either good or bad, will go away if we turn the stimulators off. So in the rare situation or rare occasion where the stimulator goes in the wrong place, it can always be turned off, and it, will, it can always be pulled out as well. But of course, that's not the goal of the surgery. Um, I have a slide talking about the mechanisms, and again, this is uh, more just to tell you that. In all honesty, we don't know the exact mechanism through which this electricity works. But way, one way to think of this is that by putting an electrode with electricity in one of these deep parts of the brain, we are disrupting a abnormal or aberrant circuit that, that is firing and causing the tremor and all the other symptoms of Parkinson's and in the case of essential tremor, causing the tremor in that condition as well. But the truth is we don't really know the exact way the stimulation works. Part of my research when I was, when I was in St. Louis in the past was looking at the mechanism of this um, treatment. And we looked at blood flow through different type of technologies, in, including something called PET scans or positive emission tomography. So I'm always proud to show some of the results of that study. Um, and there's some pictures showing decreased or increased blood flow and the theories behind that. So I'm just going to go through quickly through these slides. But just to tell you that there's a lot of research ongoing and has been done on trying to find the mechanisms and it's uh, relatively inconclusive in the end. I'm just going to skip to some of the graphs that clearly show the results. And then another interesting point or question is after the surgery, what symptoms improve. And so part of the research that we did was looking at balance testing. And I'm showing here a picture of a kinematic lab with a, a postural balance force plate in the bottom underneath the feet of this patient, where every little sway of the patient could be registered through a computer machine. And so we tested the patient on a firm surface, on a foam surface. And you can see here with the medication off on the left, medication on on the right, you can see the spread of this is clearly different. So the point is that there are ways to show in graphs how much the levodopa helps the patient's balance, for example, in this case, or the tremors or different things, and how much uh, the deep brain stimulation may help with this as well. Most of the time we use these methods for research and, and write papers, of course. So we're getting to the end of my talk, into the summary of this, and I'm showing this slide to go over the selection criteria for surgical treatment. This may change a little bit or slight changes uh, between different medical centers, but these are most widely accepted criteria. Number one, we need to have a patient with a clear diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and not a different disease, which could be mimic in Parkinson's. Number two, good response to the medication, levodopa or cinemet. Number three, failed pharmacologic therapy, which means we tried all the medications available, which I can think in my head, maybe 10 or 12 medications that 
are available for Parkinson's. And once we tried all of them and the patient still has the next bullet point, wide motor fluctuations and or severe dyskinesias, the involuntary movements. And the next bullet point says normal cognition, no dementia. So there has to be a normal mental function because if not, we could make that worse actually. Then we need to have realistic expectations um, from the patient and the family to realize that this is definitely not a cure, but it is a very good treatment, but not a cure. And of course, good family support because we're implanting a device and we need to make sure that if there's a problem in the future, the family is able to identify and call us or call the neurosurgeon as well. And then of course, there has to be access to a medical center where programming of stimulators can be done. So there are some rural areas where um, it's a little more difficult to have access to these, but the, the more and more over time, there's more and more medical centers that are able to perform the programming of the stimulators. Here's a list of the exclusion criteria for deep brain stimulation. So uh, patients who have any of this uh, list of things in this slide should not have the procedure done. Number one, dementia or memory problem that is significant. Number two, untreated psychiatric disease, such as hallucinations, for example, what we call atypical or secondary Parkinsonism or Parkinson's plus, which are this group of conditions that mimic Parkinson's but are not actually Parkinson's. Uh, somebody who has a poor surgical risk, meaning they may have other medical conditions, including heart problems, et cetera. A poor functional state while on, which means that if the person the medication kicks in and they feel on, but still the, the function is not great, then the surgery may not help too much because the, the function is not good to begin with, e even with the medication. And finally, uh, this is a relative contraindication this time because the cardiac pacemakers uh, sometimes can be in place as well as a deep brain stimulator. Sometimes instead of putting the the pulse generator under the clavicle, Dr. Dr. Hodge, another neurosurgeon may put the, the pulse generator in the abdomen or other parts of the body so that there's, it's a real estate issue in, in all fairness. So they have to be far away so that when the cardiologist programs the pacemaker, they are not cross talking to the deep brain stimulator. And when the neurologist is programming the deep brain stimulator, it doesn't cross talk or change the settings on the cardiac pacemaker but that can be worked out actually for most patients. So <clears throat> there are other targets that have been studied for um, Parkinson's disease. There are ones called the PPN or pedunculopontic nucleus that hasn't really come out for wide use, but the most common we use is the subthalamic nucleus or STN. Um, let me skip through this and the uh, VIM tar thalamus target for tremor and also another structure in the brain called the GPI or globus pallidus. There's a lot of Latin here, by the way, so we're gonna take a test at the end on Latin medical words as well. But the GPI is also done for Parkinson's disease and it helps with the dyskinesias mostly. So in our clinic, we have a number of patients with STN DBS in the subthalamic nucleus, a number of patients with GPI DBS in the globus pallidus pars internus, uh, deep brain stimulation. And we have a, a lot of patients with VIM thalamic DBS for just tremors. In conclusion, DBS is a highly effective therapy for medically intractable Parkinson's disease and also essential tremor and primary dystonia, which is a disease that I didn't expand too much on this talk. And then the second bullet points, increasing knowledge about the pathophysiology of this and other movement and neurological disorders is leading to additional applications of this therapy in other conditions. So if you look this up in the literature, now there's uh, studies looking at um, Tourette syndrome treated with deep brain stimulation, depression treated with deep brain stimulation and several other conditions. But in movement disorders, which is our field, we treat Parkinson's, essential tremor and dystonia. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I think we, we have uh, several minutes for questions in case anybody has any questions, but let me start with, and I thank you very much for um, listening to me uh, talk in this uh, kind of new way of communicating virtually. I know it's not, not that easy to do, but thank you for paying attention. By the way, I can see some of you in the screen. So that's great oh, to see you and I recognize some faces.
Yes, Larry, go ahead. Thanks so much, Freddie. We can um, actually, if we stop your sharing, we'll be able to see everybody. And I, I wanted to let you know we have, um, there are several people on the call Great. who have had the procedure. And oh, excellent. So Perfect. we invited them to be on uh, if they wanted to, if, you know, if Joyce, if anybody wanted to share um, your story or your experience. And then, of course, if you have uh, questions, um, you just have to unmute yourself. Probably the easiest way to unmute is just to hit the space bar and you hold it down and it'll keep you unmuted while you're speaking. So um, does anybody want to share, anybody who's had the procedure, have anything to add or a personal testimony? Mm, what do you... <laughs> I can speak. Okay. Hi. Hi. I have not, my husband has had DBS um, and he had bilateral on both sides um, back in 2012. And he had, was diagnosed at 41 years old and the DBS has done great. He's just really great. He works full time, um, too much actually. <laughs> But it definitely helps um, the dyskinesia from the so much medicine and the extreme movement that's gone. He doesn't have that anymore to this day. So it's lasted pretty well, but he's at his top um, setting. So he can't go any farther as far as I know with the setting. But so far, so good. That's all I have. Great. Thank you for sharing. That's a great comment. So. Okay. One of the possible side effects of DBS is being able to work too much again. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, and some, sometimes um, this can create a change in the family dynamics, by the way. And I'm going to refer uh, to the, there's been multiple studies published on this. And I had one, one specific case that I remember very well where my patient was um, spending most of the time in a wheelchair. A uh, very nice lady who had Parkinson's and spending a lot of time in the wheelchair. And once we did the DBS, she was able to drive again and go to places again. And did disrupted the family dynamics significantly because her husband had been used to being the caregiver. And now there was a, a disruption in those roles. So that created a lot of problems. And, and we ended up uh, recommending marital counseling. And that was very helpful. So be aware that DBS can change things dramatically in both directions, of course, but we, we want Definitely. to see a benefit. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. I don't know if you can hear me, Dr. Revia. This is Debbie Farr. We can. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Good, how are you, Mrs. Farr? Good, I jumped on because I'm one of your success stories. And <laughs> Robin asked me, to, asked me to join. Absolutely. And I am truly, you saved my life. You and Dr. Hodge saved my life. And June 19th of 2019 on my daughter's birthday. And I am nowhere near being maxed out on my setting. So that tells me I've got a long time to go on this DBS. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, your, your guys over at that office take great care of me. <laughs> Thank you I for sharing. Anywhere else. That is very kind of you. I would like to share. I don't know if you can hear me. We've got we you can, yes. Okay, I had my DBS done in um, the end of October 21st. And um, I've developed, I know it takes a while to program, but my question is I've developed dyskinesia and numbness in my left arm. Um, are those the things that we are? would we would work on is that a complication of the programming or is that i don't know how i guess how to ask the question but i've developed symptoms i never had before sure so i i do have an answer when the electrodes are placed in the desired target this stn or subthalamic nucleus that actually improves the symptoms but induces more dyskinesias in other words think of it that the procedure is, is restoring the ability to move. And if it's too much current or too much electricity, it will induce excessive ability to move. And those are the dyskinesias, same as the medication produces that. So 
in, in a situation like this, the most logical uh, action to take would be to lower the medication slightly to see if we find that equilibrium between the right amount of medication, the right amount of current, because if one or the other is too high, there will be too much dyskinesias. If both are too low, there will be more of the off period. So the answer to your question is we, we should definitely look into it and discuss in detail. There is ways to improve that. And the ultimate way to, to reduce any of these problems is to turn it off, but I'm not suggesting to do that. I'm just suggesting that these um, symptoms or side effects are uh, possibly reversible, okay? So definitely that needs to be done. So it's a work in progress. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> That allows me to say that the programming of the stimulators is usually done every six months for checkups. The batteries may last up to four years on average, and is the, if it's the rechargeable, it may last more than 10 years. But in the initial process after DBS, we like to do the programming every month, and if needed, every two to four to six weeks in that range until we get everything really well regulated, and, and then we go every six months. So I will I, I will say I was very happy with everybody in your office and everybody in Dr. Hodge's office. I was treated very kindly and and I, I'm looking forward to the months to come when things will calm down. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to surgery on uh, March 17th with you and Dr. Hodge. Excellent. And Excellent. I'm very heartened by what I've heard today. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm, I'm hoping that these uh, slides and the information that I presented was informational for you as well. Absolutely. Well, I understand it better now. So that's very good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Dr. Rivera, uh, this is Bob. Yes. And uh, I, I got to say that uh, I was very pleased with the uh, results I've gotten with the DBS uh, systems. I've got two electrodes. And uh, I did a little study myself when I got after the first one, I started reducing my cinemat uh, intake and I was at about 15 per day. And I reduced that down to six with, with uh, one electrode. And uh, I, I have been at six for, for a long, long time now, years. I had the, I had the electrodes put in in 19, in 20, uh, six, 2015, 14. 2014. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I've been diagnosed, uh, since, uh, two, uh, 2002. So, uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, uh, question come up about, um, uh, side effects from, from the BBS. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, double vision is, is a possibility. I developed double vision a couple of years ago, and I've gotten glasses that hopefully will, will um, fix this. But uh, I, I would just tell people, um, my a therapist at Greenville, Greenville Hospital counseled me on on the subject of driving with Parkinson's. And she, her comment was, if you have Parkinson's and you're involved in a wreck, it's your fault. You're liable for uh, all kinds of damages, she said. So I don't know what that's worth, but uh, uh, that's, that's a, a warning from a, from a uh, counselor. Yeah, so m my comments are that Double vision can be caused by Parkinson's itself, blurry vision and double vision. So the best thing to do is to have an evaluation by an uh, ophthalmologist, of course. Uh, the, the double vision caused by the stimulation usually occurs when you turn them on. So it may be more the progression of the disease and one of the symptoms of Parkinson's. And regarding the driving, the, the way I think of driving is we all have a risk of having an accident, all of us, okay? But with Parkinson's, the risk is higher. So depending on the state of the disease, it may be a little higher or maybe a lot higher. And that is the way I think of it. So if you want to reduce the risk of having an accident while um, driving with Parkinson's, of course, the best thing is to stop driving. But that, that is the relative uh, possible consequences of driving when having Parkinson's or for that matter, any other neurological disease. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sir.
Dr. Rivia? Yes. Uh, Ms. Debbie Fargan, um, I had a question. I have had, have a couple of surgeries up and coming in mm -hmm. the next couple of months. Is there a specific procedures that we do or don't have to do anything to the DBS system? The answer is yes. However, those are very uh, rarely used. One, one that comes to mind is called diathermy. So that, that one is contraindicated with DBS, but almost nobody uses diathermy anymore, to be honest. Okay. The electrocautery they use for uh, regular surgeries can be used. Um, and okay, depending like where like the location... Yeah, it can be used, correct. However, okay. It's always advisable that you tell the surgeon and the anesthesia team about the DBS, and I'm sure you have a card with you with information okay. on the company that made the equipment. Right. And they can call the company or they can call us as the neurologists who program the DBS, and we can answer any questions they might have. So in general, it is safe to have surgery as long as the surgeon and the anesthesia team have their questions answered by either the company or by us. Okay. Yeah, the only concern that my um, thyroid surgeon had was the close proximity to the cord going from the power source up to the, to the electrode placements. Absolutely. V valid concern. So having thyroid surgery, they're removing my thyroid. Mm -hmm. So they have to try to stay as they, they, the wire is coming down behind the ear and down the neck and the, the, the thyroid is in the front. So they are relatively close, but as long as they don't get into that area, you should be okay. But we'll be happy to discuss that as well with the surgeon if needed, okay? Okay, yeah, I gave him your number and Uzi's number and um, I, they took a copy of the card, the Medtronic card. Okay, perfect, thank you. I'm so grateful we had people on that could share, you know, their own personal experience too. You know, Freddie, information is always so great to have, but, you know, getting that personal. That's why I like the way you show your case studies, you know, reading out, actually see people um, with that experience. Is there anybody before we close out for today that has? I have a question. Yes, Rod. Hello, Dr. Rivera. A technical question. And uh, a couple of people say that they are two probes or two sensors installed, how many transmitters that imply? I have one transmitter. Mm -hmm. So and how many probes? Right, so your question is, uh, how many probes are usually placed? There's usually two, one on each side. So it's bilateral, one on the right, one on the right, one on the left. And the two wires come out up under the skin from the skull. And then the, there are now systems of pulse generators that one pulse generator can be connected to the two electrodes or probes to answer your question. Initially, when this technology came out in the 90s and afterwards, uh, we used to put two different pulse generators, one on each side. So there were two totally independent systems running into the holes in the skull, into the brain. Now we can connect both wires into one pulse generator. Okay, and that on the probe, they were showing three points, one, two, and three, which are the poles, or what is the function of each one of them? So the idea is that if this is the electrode, and those are four contacts that I showed in the slides, and they're labeled actually zero, one, two, and three. I don't know why they labeled it like that, but there's really four contacts. So there's contact zero, one, two, and three. This just, and, and each one is one and a half millimeters in length. So it's very tiny, as you can imagine. But that allows UC and, and myself and others in the team to choose each one of these four contacts or two of them or all of them, but usually we pick one to apply the electricity. So that's what allows us to, um, to stimulate different parts of the subthalamic nucleus or test if one of these contacts is out of the subthalamic nucleus, we can choose the one or the two that are inside the subthalamic nucleus, inside the target. So it allows us a little more flexibility in terms of the spatial distribution of the points where the electricity is going to come out into the brain. That was a question from an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can hear that. <laughs>
Any other question, Lauren? I don't, I don't see anybody's hands up. Paula looks like she's trying to talk, but I think she's muted. There okay. You go. All right. I have not had DBS. I have been diagnosed about five years and I'm trying to figure out whether I should consider it at this point or wait a couple years. I have no dyskinesias. I have a lot of tremor. It's very annoying. <laughs> and um, even on my on times, it just depends. Sometimes I don't have too much, but it seems like I always have some. Um, I Can I live with it? Can I function with it? Yes. But I don't know if I should consider brain surgery at this point. So there's two schools of thought. One would say that if you're able to tolerate your symptoms as they are now, then you probably should not have the surgery because it poses a risk, of course. And some of the risks of having any type of brain surgery is bleeding inside the brain. And uh, of course, consequences of that could be a severe disability from a hemorrhagic stroke, for example, or, or even death. So you only have to balance out the potential benefit versus the potential risk, even though the risks are very low, they, they are real. So I would say one school of thought would say, don't worry about DBS for now because you're doing very well and you don't really go in huge ups and downs and you can function very well except for the tremor that is definitely bothersome and wait. The second school of thought, which is um, backed by some um, research studies, mostly from Germany, say that doing the surgery earlier in the course of the disease may be advisable because then you, you are more functional and you have less symptoms and you can carry out your activities of daily living and your exercise, more importantly, which is the only strategy to delay the disease better than if you didn't have the surgery. So there are some studies that are promoting the surgery in earlier stages of the disease compared to the time when I trained, for example. It comes down to a personal decision. There are even some research studies being done in the U.S. doing the surgery in the first few years of disease, in the first two, three, five years of disease. That is still up uh, to discussion as to what the results of those studies will be. But at this point, I would say if we use the first school of thought, I would wait a little bit, make sure that this is being discussed um, uh, with everybody that is involved in your care, of course, and at any point that the decision is made that the symptoms are bothering you enough to go through the risk of surgery, then that is the right, right time for the surgery. Sometimes the tremor that does not respond well to levodopa, to the medication, even though the other symptoms may respond, and we call, that is called tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. And sometimes we do the DBS just because the tremor is so severe and doesn't get better with the levodopa. So I hope the answer is not too confusing, but it is truly a complex subject as to when to do the surgery. I think in your case, you have time to think about it and, and read about it as much as you can and discuss it with everybody um, in your family and, and with everybody in the care team as well. That's pretty much what I've been doing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I do think, um, Dr. Rivia, that that is, that is a commonly asked question that we get. You know, is, is it worth it? How do I look into it? Where, when should I start looking into it? I think that that's probably one of the most common concerns you hear about it. You're not really sure what it is or if it's right for you. And there's just a, that, that's a, that weighs on a lot of people. Absolutely. Good. Very good questions. And I think it's something that needs to be discussed extensively with the neurologist uh, of record and the other physicians involved, and of course, the, the family and the patient themselves. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. But I can tell you that in, in the medical centers where this procedure has been done for a long time and is being done well, the, the medical team has enough experience to determine in the end if this should be done or not. So in other words, the patient and the family could be actually requesting the procedure, but sometimes we say no because we, we think the risk is too high compared to the possible benefit and vice versa as well, that the opposite can happen as well. So it's very important to, to discuss this with a team that has had enough experience in dealing with these type of questions for a long time, of course.
Thank you. You're welcome. Well, as always, Dr. Villa, we're so grateful for your time and your support and always your willingness to come and talk with our members. So thank you for the, we did record this, so um, we will be getting this available for everybody. Um, if you wanna review it, watch it again, there was a lot of information here that we went had to go through pretty quickly, but thanks all of you for being here. And again, thanks Dr. Rivia for your time. My pleasure, thank you for inviting me, Lauren. Bye-bye.